The oil age has been going on in, in America for about 150 years. And at various points along the line, even you know as early as the late 19th century, there were theories that we would run out of oil, that it was uh, even more finite than we th think now. And what happened was we kept on discovering more of it. And um, however, the catch is is that there is an arc of discovery as much as there is an arc of production. The man responsible for um, uh, understanding this idea and presenting that information to the public was an oil geologist named Marion King Hubbard, uh, who was the chief geologist for a number of the the majors, as they're called, major or, uh, oil producers, as well as a, uh, a professor at Columbia University. Hubbard came up with a model for understanding uh, uh, oil discovery and production. It became known as Hubbard's curve, and it's a it's a bell curve graph. And it states that um, uh, any given region or locality will reach a peak of production. Uh, and it will follow the discovery by about 30 years, the peak of discovery. And that afterward, um, uh, the oil can be expected to decline steadily. And these were based on the data that had been coming into both the uh, major oil companies and the United States government for decades and decades, you know, starting from the turn of the century. The point is um, that um, it was predicted for uh, at many points during the, the long history of oil production in the U.S. that we were going to run out of oil. And so each time we recovered, you know, somebody came along in the 1920s and said, oh, my God, there's all this tremendous amount of driving now going on and and we'll never have enough oil to meet the demand and you know lo and behold the 1930s came along in the Great Depression more oil was discovered in the United States during the, the Great Depression than before the boom of the 1920s and so it got to a point where there was simply an expectation that no matter how many Cassandras popped up that we would always find more and even after we stopped finding more in the United States, even after it was clear that, that our discovery had peaked after the 1930s, and by the 1950s and 60s, this was understood, we didn't pay that much attention because we just expected, well, the rest of the world has been developed m much more recently, and the rest of the world is much bigger than the United States. They'll certainly find much, much more oil out there, and we won't have to worry about it for, for maybe centuries. Here's what actually happened, though. Um, uh, Hubbard predicted that the U.S. would reach its peak production around 1970, based on all that discovery and production data that he had. You know, he, uh, uh, Hubbard had his whole career through the, the most robust um, period of the American oil industry, so he had been watching it for decades. Uh, and he lived a long life. Uh, uh, so he predicted that the U.S. would peak around 1970, and lo and behold, the U.S. peaked in 1970. Exactly. It wasn't until several years later when the production data came in and was analyzed that we realized, hey, you know, we actually produced more oil in 1970 than we did in 1972, or even 1971, and certainly 1973. There's something happening here. Well, this did not escape the attention of people in other parts of the world. And by this time, uh, many of the Arab producers and, and Muslim nations noticed that something was going on in the United States, that, that we had, in effect, lost our pricing power because we had no more surplus production anymore. We had peaked. We couldn't open up the valves and produce more to drive the price down. And so these uh, this club called OPEC decided, well, gosh, since we now have the pricing power and we do have surplus production, we'll just take over. And so we had the, the OPEC oil problem. Now, this was um, provoked uh, really by the 1973 um, Arab-Israeli war. And um, uh, that sort of gave the OPEC nations, many of whom were Muslim countries, uh, a kind of uh, um, opportunity to flex their political mus muscles. 
and to sort of show the United States that uh, somebody else in the world had considerable economic power. Um, and they were very ticked off at us for our support of Israel during the war, and especially for, for the airlifts that we undertook to resupply Israel at a crucial time. So OPEC got together and said, oh, well, we're going to have an embargo against you now because you, you, know, you did something we didn't like. But they also showed, you know, who now had the pricing power. So America uh, went through this turbulent decade of the 1970s when really economically things turned upside down. And um, uh, uh, we discovered that when oil prices rise, all of a sudden you're caught up in a mad web of inflation because the price of everything else goes up in your society, as do other things like interest rates. And when you have extraordinary interest rates at something like, you know, 17, 19, 20 percent, that produces terrible distortions in your economy. People can't buy houses anymore because they will not take on long-term loans at 20 percent. And, you know, if your economy is largely predicated on building suburban houses and stuff like that and selling cars to people who use them, well, you've got a big problem. And we had a big problem in the 1970s. Well, uh, things changed. Because of the trauma of uh, the oil crises of the 70s, um, a lot of oil that had been discovered in other parts of the non-OPEC world was very rapidly brought into production, namely the oil in Alaska and the oil in the North Sea between England and Norway. And those two uh, regions pretty much saved the West, and in particular America, from being at the mercy of the OPEC nations for about two decades. But one of the consequences of that was that the, the, the Saudis decided that they would benefit much more from living in a, a stable economic market than from uh, consistently goosing and tweaking and provoking the American economy and making it rise and fall and putting it through all this turmoil because it was in effect destroying demand for their product. They didn't do it to be altruistic. They, they did it um, to continue an orderly um, exploitation of the one resource they had to sell to the rest of the world, oil. The Arabians have terrible problems themselves. You know, having lived in a society that's artificially supported by one resource, they've generated a huge population of people who, under really any other conditions, couldn't be supported on the Arabian Peninsula, which has virtually nothing else. It's all sand and heat no water, you know, almost zero agricultural land, and all of a sudden they've got this massively large population that couldn't possibly subsist there. So, so you know, they're in a predicament of their own, and they know it. And to some extent, uh, you know, it makes them crazy.